Okay, thank you all for coming. Um, I thought I would tell you a little bit about some past work, some current work, some possible future work that sits at the intersection between communications, controls, and thinks a little bit, starts to think a little bit about the cost of separating these things from each other. Um, I'll apologize in advance. I think some of you have heard parts of this, but there's some uh, mix of communities here, and so I thought I'd better start from the beginning in talking about this work. So to imply information theory to very complex network systems, something as ambitious as cognition, we would need, first of all, an information theory that scales. That is something that can tell us results about networks of uh, many, many components communicating with each other. And also, uh, we'd need a, a stronger bridge between communications and controls. And so I thought I would tell you about both of those pieces a little bit and maybe a little bit about how they fit together as well. So as an outline of the talk, I'll tell you about some tools that we've been working with that are useful at least, I think, for the first of these tasks and maybe for the second. That is useful for building up an information theory for networks of many, many components, and maybe will tell us something about an information theory that helps us interact uh, better with controls. And then I'll give you an example of how these tools work uh, in thinking about what the impact of delay is on capacity, and then show how those tools have an impact on building an information theory that scales and building a bridge from communications to controls, maybe. So the first topic was tools. And the tool that I'll tell you about is a tool that goes way, way back in time, but let's make sure we all start on the same page and talk about the tool. The tool that I'm interested in here is reduction, which is a very commonly used tool in computer science in particular. When people look at the complexity of algorithms, they use this tool very frequently, but less commonly used in information theory. So let me first tell you about how that tool works in the first world, and then we'll translate into the information theoretic world. So imagine that you're given two problems, problem A and problem B, that you're interested in solving. And imagine also that you have available to you a solution for A, and you can show that you can build a bit of machinery <coughs> such that your solution for A plus this machinery will give you a solution for B. So you have a tool that solves one problem, you build a little bit of machinery around that tool, and it gives you a new tool that uh, solves a different problem. And what they do in complexity theory is notice that if the machinery that you built is very simple, then it must be that the complexity of solving problem B can't be much greater than the complexity of solving A, because you can take an algorithm for solving one and turn it into an algorithm for solving the other with very low complexity. Now, that sounds almost too simple to be interesting. What makes it interesting is that you can play this game even when you don't know the solution for problem A. So suppose that you have some problem A that you wish you can solve, you have no idea how to solve it, or at least don't know what the best way to solve it is in terms of complexity. But still, if you could show that any solution for A can be turned into a solution for B with just a little bit of simple machinery, then it's still true that the complexity for B can't be much greater than the complexity for A. And therefore, we can avoid solving this hard problem and still get a relationship between two types of problems and their complexity. Now, as I said, that's the complexity world. It isn't the world that I'll talk about today, um, but it is where the tool is more frequently used. But you can imagine playing the same game in information theory. So imagine now that we have not two problems, but two networks, some network A and some network B. Imagine these being very large and very complex networks. Now, if you had a code that reliably communicated across the network A, and you could show that you could build a bit of machinery, so whatever the code was doing before, plus this machinery gives you a new code for network B, then it must be true that if this new machinery makes certain guarantees, that is that the error probability and the rate are asymptotically the same, then it must be that anything that's achievable in network A is also achievable in network B. Again, we can play this game whether we know what's achievable in network A or not. That is, even if you don't know what you can and can't do, you don't know how to build an optimal code for network A. If you can show that just any code for network A plus a bit of machinery allows you to get a code for B that has asymptotically the same rate and the same error probability, then it must be that rates that are achievable in network A are also achievable in network B. 
which tells you that the capacity region for network A must be a subset or equal to the capacity region for network B. We can get relationships between these things even when we don't know what the capacity even of the original network looks like. This is the game that we'd like to play. And what it points out is that there's a lot of power in good machinery, which is to say figuring out not only how to build codes, but even just how to take a code for one network and turn it into another network gives you a great power in terms of proving theoretical results about capacities of networks that don't require that you completely solve either capacity problem. Now, I should point out, and I, I think I said it at the beginning, but let me say it again, that these are not new strategies. They're strategies that go back uh, decades in both the CS theory literature and perhaps more indirectly in the information theory literature. That is, certainly this is an approach that's been used for many years in CS theory. I don't think that people have necessarily thought about it this way in information theory, but if you look inside certain proofs, you can see basically that idea happening in the information theory literature as well. I'm not at all sure that these are the earliest examples, but they are examples of very early literature uh, taking this approach. Now, as I mentioned, I thought I would give you an example of how this works to keep it more concrete rather than the abstract description that I originally gave. And so I apologize for this very complicated slide, but let's just at least define things. I, I don't think it's as complicated as it looks, um, so hopefully you'll stick with me. So imagine that you have a network that has M nodes, and M is a very large network. So think of M not as five nodes or 10 nodes. Think of M as all the nodes in the internet or your wireless provider's network, and so on. So we'll call that network script N. And we'll imagine that at every node in this network, there's some message coming in. So W of 1, W of 2, and so on are the messages coming in at each of these nodes. And likewise, each of these nodes has some collection of demands that it's interested in reconstructing. So W hat of D1 is node 1's reconstruction of the demands that he wishes to uh, reconstruct. If we're going to use a block length n code, then message wi will be one of two to the nri possible values. And the reconstruction w hat di will be the reconstruction of all the wj's in that demand set at node i. Now at each time t, each node gets to transmit some message and receive some message, and we'll call those xt and yt. The superscript i just tells you which node that we're looking at. And the transmission can only be a function of things that that node knows at that time. So he knows his outgoing message and he knows everything that's happened on the channel so far. That is the y sub i's, the outcoming messages for times 1 through t minus 1. Notice that we've constrained this system to be causal. That is, we don't know what happened at time t when we are transmitting because it hasn't happened yet. We're about to transmit. We only know what's happened in the past. And that causality constraint is, of course, important. The probability of error in this system will be the probability that anybody reconstructs any of their desired sources incorrectly. And the capacity region will just be all rates ri that you can simultaneously achieve across this network. It's a very large and complex space that we'd like to start to learn something about. All right, so to give you some idea of how this tool works in the information theory world, which again is not the traditional place in which it's been applied, let's imagine that uh, we want to ask a very simple question, which is what is the impact of delay on capacity? That is, how much does it hurt you to add delays at one or more receivers in your network? Imagine, for example, we delay a single channel output, Y2, in this system, which is why I've designated it by red, by an arbitrary amount. And in fact, you can delay all of the outputs by as much as you want, finite amounts that are known in advance. And the question is, what will that do to your capacity? add delays anywhere you like in this network, what is the impact that will have on capacity? And this is a question that people have thought about over the years. Um, this is a collection of papers where people have studied this question in very simple sub-cases. I'd like to study it in the case of the most general network that I've defined in the previous slide. So people have looked at this case in relay channels, in networks of relay channels, and so on. And in each of the papers that I've listed for you there, there is some suggestion that delay does increase, uh, does decrease capacity, that it does have an impact on capacity, and we'd like to somehow try and understand, is that correct? None of these results quite prove that that happens um, in the model that we have. 
we'd like to know is that the case by how much does it change capacity and so on all of these suggest that it does and using the tool that I've just described for you the result that we get is actually that that delay doesn't change capacity at all that no matter where you add delay in your network no matter how many cycles and things you have in your network which is sort of where the intuition that delay should increase uh, decrease capacity comes from the fact that gosh if I add delay somewhere in a cycle I'm gonna get further and further behind somehow in running a code it turns out that that's not the case um, in our system model now as I mentioned in all of these previous examples each one of them suggests that delay does have an impact in capacity in a different network system um, but they do that by giving either upper bounds that turn out to be loose by the result that I give or by violating causality um, that is by not enforcing that strict notion of causality uh, that I defined where when you transmit at time t you can only use information that was available to you in times prior to t so uh, the result that we give doesn't contradict any of these prior results it either applies in a different space the causal space or it says that their upper bounds are loose all right so let's actually go ahead and look at that result and how it's proven because it's very simple to prove even in this most general case your million billion whatever it is node network when you have this kind of reduction argument available to you so in order to prove that these two capacity regions are the same these are the capacity region of the network with delay and the capacity region of the network without delay we have to prove two relationships one is that the first the second region is a subset of the first and the second will be that the first region is a subset of the second and we'll prove this just for a single added delay if you can prove the result for a single added delay you can prove it for any finite number of delays using an inductive argument so that's easy to get I'll draw the network as if it has only two nodes because it looks ugly enough already but keep your million uh, and that's fine uh, none of the argument changes no matter how many nodes you have as you'll see when we go through it so here we are trying to prove that the capacity region for the network with delays is a subset or equal to the capacity region for the network with delays and again I'm sorry without delays and we're going to do that uh, by this reduction strategy so what do we do first we imagine that we have a code any code uh, on the network with delays so a code built for this network we want to show that with a little bit of machinery we can run that same code on the network without delays so here's my code just to orient you in this horrible looking table we have here the transmissions from node 1 and from node 2 at times 1 2 3 and so on and what I've drawn in here is just what they can rely on so at time 1 you know only your outgoing message at time 2 since receiver 1's message is delayed he knows no channel outputs he still knows only his message that he's trying to transmit but transmitter 2 since he doesn't have any delays he knows both his outgoing message and the receive Y's up to that point and so on so at each time we have something that we transmit and at the end we do our reconstructions we have some rate and some probability of error I want to show that you can get the same rate and the same probability of error even if you don't have this delay and of course that's trivial to do if you have a network without delay this Y1 now comes earlier in each of these time slots but exactly the prior code can be run without change and therefore we can run exactly the same prior uh, code our machinery is nothing we can run exactly that same code on the network with no delays get exactly the same rate and the same error probability so anything that we could do on the network with delays we can certainly do on the network without delays as well that part is trivial that shows us that the capacity on the network with delays is a subset or equal to the capacity of the original network the network with no delays all right now the harder result comes along we'd like to show that if we have a code for the network with no delays we can run that code on the capacity with delays with an asymptotically negligible change in rate and error probability and the question is how in the world do you do that so here we imagine that we have a code that was built for the network that has no delays and we'd like to try and run that code on the network once we add that single delay at transmitter one or at node one and the problem is it looks like that's going to be difficult right because if I have a, co a network with delays well let's see here's what I transmitted at time one there was a delay in the receipt of that information at node one which means that we won't have the information that we need to send both of the next transmission symbols until time three 
because we can only transmit one time step after receiving the information. So we won't have that information until time three. Again, there's going to be another delay, which looks like we won't be able to transmit till time five, and then seven, and then nine. It looks like it's going to take us twice as long, which will hurt the rate a lot. Right? So this is not a good way to run this code across this network. We need something better if we're going to show that this same code can be run with asymptotically the same rate and the same error probability. So what will we do? We'll try and build better machinery for running the code built for the network without delays on this network with delays. And here's what the machinery will look like. Imagine that instead of having a single message of block length n, we, break, we consider a code of block length 2n and we break that message into two uh, messages, two sub-messages, each a block length n. So we have a message, each of these messages is an, in the alphabet 1 through 2 to the n r1, and together they're in the alphabet 1 through 2 to the 2 n times r1. So we're taking this block length 2 n message and breaking it up into two messages of block length n. And we'll do the same thing for message two. So now we're building a block length two n code. We're going to treat the two pieces as sub-messages, each a block length n. How are we going to use these two sub-messages? Well, let's imagine that we first start off with the first sub-message using the block length n code from the other network. We'll send that in the odd time slots. And because of the fact that we won't be ready to send the next uh, transmission for that message until time three, let's go ahead and start off the second sub-message in the even time slots. So we'll get the second message going in the even time slots while we're waiting for its output. We'll now be ready to send the uh, first sub-message, and we'll just alternate between the two of these. You'll notice by the union bound that if you alternate the two of these codes, you'll get an error probability bounded by twice the error probability for the original code. So if you had a sequence of codes with error probability going to zero before, you still will now. So that's OK. And you'll notice also that it's going to just take us 2n plus 1 time steps to send 2n times r bits. And therefore, asymptotically, our rate change is also negligible. So anything that we could asymptotically achieve in the original network with no delays, we can also asymptotically achieve in this network with delays. We did it for a single delay. Again, the inductive argument says add another delay, another delay, and so on. Each time there will be no change in capacity. Therefore, delay has no impact on capacity at all in this causal uh, model. Now I give you this example just as a way of showing that this tool gives us very simple arguments for uh, deriving complex and interesting results. We didn't know what the capacity was before we added delay. We still don't know what the capacity is after delay, but we do know that they're equal to each other. And we know that no matter how large the network was, and no matter how hard it is to prove that directly when you're trying to prove the precise capacity region, which is what all of those prior papers tried to do. They were trying to pr prove precise capacity regions. We didn't prove any capacity regions, what they look like. We just proved that they're equal to each other. We still don't know the exact values those problems remain hard. But if we had them solved without delay, we'll also have them solved with delay now. So if one problem is easier to solve than the other, we've just made it easy, equally easy to solve both of them. So now, as I mentioned, I told you about this tool in this context just because it's a simple example. It's the same tool that we've been using to start thinking about uh, building a scalable information theory. I'm sorry, I thought that this would give me a good timing, but it hasn't. So, all right, so how does this work? Information theory has been studying uh, <coughs> capacities for networks of multiple transmitters and receivers for decades now. But in fact, those problems are very difficult. So each of these examples is an example of a problem that has been partially solved, but none of these examples has been completely solved um, in terms of its capacities, despite the fact that people have been working very hard on these problems for decades. It's just that they're extremely difficult. And so the question is, if these problems are difficult, how are we ever going to scale up to the internet or the wireless uh, providers network or, or whatever it is? To make life more complicated, it turns out that capacities don't compose. That is, even if you look at examples where the capacity of one network, in this case a broadcast network, and the capacity of another network, in this case a multiple access network, even if you look at cases where those capacities are precisely known, it turns out that you can't just put their capacities together and find the capacity of the network end to end. So for example, the amount of information that I can send from node 1 to node 4 in this network, even when I know these two, um, is not always solved. So 
the problem here is that node 1 can sometimes send more information to node 4 than either the sum rate for the broadcast channel or the sum rate for the multiple access channel suggests is possible. And the issue there is essentially this. When you're transmitting through a broadcast channel, you assume that each of those receivers has to decode their message independently. And of course, in this network, that's not necessarily the case. These nodes don't necessarily have to decode at all. And therefore, the rate that we can get from 1 to 4 is sometimes bigger than the rate that we can get to 2 plus the rate that we can get to 3 in this broadcast channel. And likewise, in a multiple access channel, we assume that the transmitters have to act totally independently. That is, that their inputs have to be statistically independent of each other. But in this case, that's not necessarily true either, because in this broadcast channel, you get outputs of the broadcast channel that are statistically dependent. And you can use that dependence, if you want to, to transmit dependent inputs. And therefore, sometimes you can get more information from 1 to 4 then you can get total from 2 to 4 and 3 to 4 according to the capacity region of the multiple access channel. So in some cases, not only are these values higher, in some cases they're much, much higher. Therefore, even if we solved all of these small examples, it wouldn't give us a way to scale up to very large networks. In the work that I've mentioned in thinking about building a scalable information theory, the game that we played is to try and come up with models for information theoretic components that do compose. Since capacity doesn't do it for us, maybe there's something else that will. And the basic idea here is this. Imagine that you have a network N, and that somewhere in there is some channel, maybe the broadcast channel from my prior slide. And you'd like to understand what the capacity of this network looks like, but Understanding what that looks like with that specific broadcast channel inside may be kind of difficult. So what we'd like to do is we've come up with a notion of an upper bounding model and a lower bounding model for that particular channel. Where a channel model CU is an upper bounding model if ripping this channel out of the network and replacing it by CU instead guarantees that the capacity region either remains the same or increases. It never decreases. Likewise, a bounding model is a lower bounding model. C sub L is a lower bounding model for C if pulling channel C out of the network and replacing it by C sub L gives you a new network such that the capacity region of that new network is always a subset or equal to the capacity region of the original network. Now, we'd like these ideas to apply no matter what the rest of the network looks like and no matter what information you're trying to send through so that we get these sort of Lego-like building blocks out of which we can come up with a much simpler model for our original network. We'll do this not just for one channel but for every channel in the network to try and come up with simplified models of our network that we can hope to actually find capacity for. And here are some examples of the capacities that we've solved so far or the bounding models that we've come up with so far. We have the for broadcast, multiple access, uh, relay, interference, and, and other channels. And these are just some examples of what they look like. In all of the cases, the models that we've been building have been made out of lossless links. And the reason that we've been making our models out of lossless links is because there exist computational algorithms already that can help us solve capacities of networks of lossless links. So what we'd like to do is take networks of wireless components, replace all of them with networks of wireless links, find the network coding capacities of those networks. If you find the network coding capacity of the upper bounding models, you'll get an upper bound on your capacity. For the lower bounding models, you'll get a lower bound on your capacity. I guess the last thing that I should point out is that our lower bounding models and our upper bounding models are often but not always different from each other. And the reason for that is that the power of a particular component, say a broadcast channel, actually depends on what the network around it looks like. That is, as in the prior example, if the broadcast receivers have some way of working together to decode information because of the rest of the network structure, or if the multiple access transmitter have some way of sending dependent information because of the rest of the network structure, you may be able to get more information through that component than you could in another network in which they don't have that capability, in which the network structure doesn't provide that extra capability. All right. Instead of going through this example, because I think I will run tight on time, this is an example that shows what our upper and lower bounding models are for a single point-to-point -point channel. So we imagine that somewhere in your network you have a point-to-point -point channel, say a wire, a coax cable, whatever it is, and the rest of the network is an arbitrarily complicated network. We're just going to come up with a model for that one component. It turns out that in that case, the upper and lower bounding models are the same. 
and they look exactly like a lossless link of exactly the same capacity as the capacity of this point-to-point -point channel, whatever that was. So we know the capacity of that point-to-point -point channel um, from Shannon's original channel coding theorem, and we can show that even if that component sits in an arbitrarily complicated network, the capacity of the network is unchanged if you remove that component and replace it by a lossless link of the same capacity. And the argument goes just the same way as the kind of argument we used for delay was. That is, we show that if you have a code that runs on the network with a lossless link, you can run it on the network with a noisy channel by using a channel code to make that channel look like a lossless link. You have to actually be very careful in how you do that um, it's more delicate than it sounds, but that is how the argument works. Likewise, if you have a, a code that works on the network with a noisy channel, you can run that network on the noiseless link by using something I like to think of as a source coder. You can add an encoder and a decoder across this rate C link and show that that source code, think of it as a lossy source code, can come up with a description for X described at rate C such that the reconstruction at the source code's decoder has statistics so similar to the channel output Y that would have happened in this original network that any code that was designed to run on this network with error probability going to zero can also be run on this network with error probability also going to zero, although not as quickly as before, because now you have the additional errors of the channel, uh, c of the source code to contend with. All right, now to get on to the, the next topic, the next question that I'd like to think about a little bit is can these same ideas be applied in a world with controls instead of just capacity? That is a world in which we think not just about transmitting information reliably, but instead about running active components across some network. You'll remember that when we define the communication problem, we define our problem as one of reliable information transmission. There's no sort of notion of a penalty for delay. You can wait as long as you want. By all means, let block length go to infinity and so on. But of course, when we think about controls, delay is critical. The idea that capacity is not impacted by delay certainly wouldn't work in a controls kind of viewpoint. We have a very different uh, worldview in the control system. And so the question is, how can we put these two things together? That is, what if you have a network that is not about transmitters sending information to each other reliably in the long run, but instead is something where you have plants and you have sensors and you have controllers all communicating with each other through a network system, can the same kind of tools be used in this world as well? Um, now, as I mentioned, we've used reduction to study capacity, and I should point out that we've also used the same technique to study a variety of other kinds of communication problems. So, for example, instead of just reliable information delivery, what if your goal is some sort of rate distortion kind of goal, where you have sources that may be statistically dependent, you're trying to communicate them through a network. The same kinds of tools work in that case. They work with some non-ergodic channel models, such as um, adversarial models of components in your network. They work in a secure capacity perspective, where your goal is to keep the information from somebody who's trying to listen in. So you're trying to send your information securely. They also work as a way of modeling noiseless components. So imagine that you have some complicated network all made out of lossless links, but it has thousands if not millions of links in it. You can take sub-networks of that network and come up with models for those in order to simplify your network model. You can come up with upper and lower bounds for those component models so that you can hope to find capacities using the computational tools that are available, but using them in less time, because their complexity does grow with the number of edges in the networks. We'd also like to understand whether it can help us think about this communications and controls problem. Now, there are several ways to think about the problem. Here are two. One way is to try and think about the joint communications and controls problem. And the other way is to try and separate these two into the communications problem and the controls problem and think about what the penalty for that separation actually would be. I called it the joint communications and controls problem, but in some sense, if you look at the joint problem, there isn't really a separate communication problem and a controls problem. There is somehow just a single design problem that if you were coming at it from the controls problem, maybe you would think of as a very large scale distributed stochastic controls problem where your network is just some extra source of randomness in your uh, controls problem. If you're coming at it from the information theoretic perspective, you might think of this problem as a big lossy communication problem 
problem where you have funny distortion measures that somehow encode your controls um, objectives. Either way, this problem will be very hard to think about at very large scale. And so I'll think about not this joint problem, but instead the separated problem simply for simplicity and also for practicality. I think that um, the idea that you're going to build a system using a joint model in most cases isn't realistic simply because somebody's going to control the network somebody else is going to try and run a system over that network you know imagine trying to run a controls process over the internet you can't sort of rewire the whole internet and get it to run your way you're, you're sort of stuck with somebody else's communications protocol so we're likely to do these things separately in many practical applications um, and therefore this is the world that I'll, I'll think about the perspective that I'll take. Now, in this case, I've drawn each of the nodes that I had before as two nodes, just to sort of give you an illustration uh, visually of a, a separated approach. So that's all that's meant here. Uh, before we go on, let me just point out that I'm by no means claiming that this approach is optimal. It's very clearly suboptimal to separate communications and controls from each other. It, it's just practical, um, and not optimal. Even source coding and channel coding in the network system don't separate from each other. They shouldn't be separate problems. If you want to operate optimally, you need to do those two things together. But for the purposes of practicality, I, I will go ahead and, and keep them separate. So in thinking about separation, an important first question to ask is what parameters should govern the interaction between your controls algorithm and your communication algorithm? That is, what is it that the communication system should guarantee to the control system? Or what parameters should the control system come to the communication system and ask for? What kind of reliability do you want? What does reliability mean in this system? Is there a notion of rate? And so on. You need to decide how to talk between these two uh, algorithms and what it is that they should agree on before they transmit. And once you start to separate along different parameters, you might ask the question, how good was your choice of parameters by asking what is the cost of separation under that particular family of parameters, under that per particular parameter choice. So in thinking about the first question, um, if you look in the literature, you'll see that there are many possible answers, and these are, are just some of the answers from the prior literature. This isn't even the most recent literature, but it was a particularly fertile period for publication. And this is not a question that I'll look at myself. Um, there are many, many suggestions that people make as to what it is that your communication algorithm and your controls algorithm should be agreeing on. And I just picked one of them as a simple first uh, test case. I'm not sure that any of these answers will always be the right answer. In fact, I'm pretty sure that the right answer will vary as a function of your particular problem. But these are examples and let's choose one and just see how well it does in terms of this uh, separated problem. So the example that I chose was anytime reliability. And I don't know that everybody is familiar with anytime reliability, so let me just give you an illustration of what it means. Imagine that at each time step, you transmit a little bit of your information. Messages are no longer available all at the beginning of time. Instead, think of your information as a stream that's coming along. At each time step, you're transmitting some chunk of that information. And now what anytime reliability says is that you should be able to decode as many past pieces as you want with a reliability that increases for each piece with the amount of time since that transmission occurred. In other words, imagine that we wish to reconstruct at time k the messages that were transmitted at times 1 through i, and we're here assuming that k is strictly greater than i. So we'll look at our reconstruction of those first i time steps at time k. And in order for a code to be called anytime reliable, we'll force, we'll, we'll try to guarantee that there exists some constant k so that the error probability decays exponentially according to some parameter alpha and some uh, constant k minus i, which is just the shortest time gap from the last of the symbols that you're trying to reconstruct. So you would like to be able to guarantee that you can decode each of these messages with greater and greater reliability at every time. And these codes are actually nested or tree codes that allow you, say at time 12, to reconstruct all of the prior messages. The reliability of each of those messages is a function of just the distance from the time at which you're trying to reconstruct. 
So you get better and better reconstructions of every message that has been transmitted so far. Now I'm not sure whether any time reliable codes would be used in this sort of nested form or whether it's just the curve maybe that's interesting. That is being able to tell a controls algorithm, look if you're willing to wait this long here's how reliable I can be for you and having you choose which point you want to operate on is probably a more likely scenario for a controls algorithm to use than for it to actually be progressively reconstructing better and better reconstructions of data that's getting further and further out of date. But it does give you some sort of mechanism for these two algorithms to talk to each other. That is, it gives you a way of thinking about, look, here is the trade-off that you'll experience if you try and run your controls algorithm over my communications algorithm. Here's the trade-off between delay and reliability that I can offer you. And by the way, I can offer you all of them. So operate at whichever point you want if you use an anytime reliable code. All right, as I said, this was just an example. The algorithms that they use are tree codes, and uh, for the sake of time, I won't go through how those algorithms work. It's actually a surprisingly simple algorithm to get all of these things at the same time, to get all of these reconstruction values at the same time. To give you an idea of the kinds of results that we've been developing, we've started to come up with upper and lower bounds using these kinds of reduction arguments um, for these anytime modes of communication as well. So for example, imagine that you have a network N and let that network N be a network of wireline channels. Let e network NL be the network that you get when you replace each of those wireline noisy channels by a wireless channel, each of the same capacity as the corresponding link in the original network. What we've been able to show is that if the rate R and the constant alpha, alpha was this rate of decay in the error probability, so it's your error exponent term uh, for the anytime reliability. If the rate alpha and that reliability constant, I'm sorry, if the rate R and the reliability constant alpha were achievable on the network with lossless links, then what we're able to show is that the same rate R and a reliability coefficient that depends not only on alpha but also on the worst case channel in your network um, then that one will be in the achievable uh, values for the original network N. That is, you can find out something about what can be achieved on your network of noisy links by studying what's possible on your network of noiseless links. So it, it gives you some way of scaling up to large networks without having to solve the whole network simultaneously in this anytime reliability sense. Um, what this gives us is some sort of separation uh, or, or some sort of bound on how separation algorithms will perform. That is, for any R alpha that's achievable on your network of lossless links, we know that R theta is achievable on your network of lossy links, where theta is somewhere between the value you could get when they were lossless and the value that you can get um, or the bound that we got from the prior result. So it tells you that, look, if you can design your algorithms in a way, your controls algorithm, in a way that they'll work even in this worst case coefficient, you're guaranteed they'll be fine for the network of noisy links. If, however, this worst case result is, isn't good enough for your controls algorithm, you can ask yourself the question, could I have gotten it under the original parameter alpha? Would that have been good enough for me? If that wouldn't have been good enough for you, then your network of noisy links certainly isn't going to work under this separated strategy. But if in fact that would have been good enough for you, then, then the result becomes ambiguous. Then we're not sure if the problem is that our theta um, our achievability was loose or whether it's actually not possible on that lossy link. So it starts to resolve the space of what is and isn't possible in this separated controls and capacity world. So just to summarize a little bit, anytime reliability is just one model for separating communications and controls. Under this model, we're able to look at distributed multi-plant uh, controls across a network using solutions just about any time reliability network coding capacity and distributed controls under rate and reliability constraints. So it allows us to separate out a very complicated problem into two problems that are hopefully easier. One is a network coding problem, now solved in a any time reliability kind of sense, and the other is a distributed controls kind of problem. And I'll just point out that while we looked as a first case at this anytime capacity kind of notion, anytime reliability kind of notion, our tools aren't specific to that. These are the same kinds of reduction arguments that we've been using. Somehow we do have to apply them in a way that applies to each particular definition, but it could be applied under uh, other definitions as well, and hopefully would give similar results. 
Now my original hope in, in working on this question is that we would not only be able to get uh, achievability kinds of results, but we would also be able to get bounds on the cost of separation. And it turns out that getting that bound, at least using the technique that we're looking at, uh, sort of relies on a question that so far we haven't been able to answer, which is the question of what I'll call anytime source coding. That is, can you build the same kind of nested source codes that mimic the notion of uh, reliability that allow better and better reconstruction of all your data as you keep transmitting more and more data. If you can build those anytime source codes, there, that seems to be the key, at least through this technique, for finding a bound on the cost of separating these two strategies from each other. And so that one remains an open question. And I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you. Hey. So, do, do you have some idea what, if you were building a network code for these kinds of anytime codes? You know, how much can you borrow from what, you know, the, the, the techniques that have been developed? Or how much do you have to start from scratch? I mean, I know it's, it's early on, it's maybe not. Yeah. I I think actually that the techniques that we've developed will work well, but it's a matter of doing the arguments and, and I haven't done those arguments yet. So I, the argument that goes from capacity achieving codes to anytime capacity achieving codes is extremely simple. And so I suspect that the same thing will be true to go from network codes to anytime network codes. But that's a piece I haven't tried yet. So my suspicion is that the transition will be easy, but until we try it, we don't know for sure. Other questions? So, in your capacity of definitions, I think it's a Shannon definition. My original definition was Shannon. The anytime capacity is a high and midder. So, what if the application allows delay? So, uh, some people call this delay constraint capacity. If you can tolerate delay, uh, when channel gets better, you can, you can trust the higher data rate. What, that kind of capacity is different from. Yeah, so in our notion, we had a memoryless, non-changing channel. So this issue of being able to sort of adjust as your channel gets better and worse hasn't been modeled in the kinds of systems I've presented. But the, the Sahai and Mitter model of capacity differs from this delay uh, tolerant model in some sense, which has to do with that they, they require that you can actually get all those points on the curve using a single code. So it's not that I choose, here's the delay I want, and here's the reliability that I can get at that delay, and I'll just operate at that point. They actually simultaneously operate at all of those points. They allow you to use the same code, whether you want to decode with delay D, or 2D, or 5D, or, or whatever it happens to be. So these definitions are, are certainly closely related to each other. I suspect that asymptotically, you know, that in some sense they'll get the same values, but I don't know if anybody has actually gone in and verified that kind of observation. Um, whether you can show that the rates that are achievable with the kinds of models that you're talking about are all also always achievable with this reliability model. Because they assume in their anytime capacity results that uh, they have a stationary system, it's memoryless, nothing is changing. So they don't allow the kinds of changes that you're considering. So actually, my, my question uh, seems to be uh, there should be cooling theory involved. Because if the packet delay, violates the delay bound, it's useless. So I'm talking about those kind of things. I see. <laughs> yeah. So in the original Sahai and Mitter results, they're just looking at a single channel, so queuing theory doesn't come up. As soon as you start putting in the whole network of these channels, and talk about the network coding version of anytime reliability, then you certainly would have the delay associated with the nodes as well as the delay associated with the channels. You'd have to take all of those things into account. As far as I know, nobody has done that yet. So we've been able to show the relationship between the anytime capacity of that network and the anytime capacity of um, a network of noisy links, you know, noiseless and noisy, but we haven't calculated what either one are, nor have we modeled the delays of the nodes themselves. If you wanted to find those anytime capacities, you certainly should include those in your models. So that's work that hasn't been done yet. But it's a very interesting question. Yeah. I guess we should move on to the next. Thank you.